My first question to you is we know that sanctions are uh, very kind of tough when it comes to actually sanctioning energy and other commodities just given the dependence on Russia. But what about tariffs? What is the take from Washington on tariffs when it comes to addressing the commodity space? Great question. And as we know from the 2018 to 2020 period, there is unlimited basically capacity at the administration level to shift tariffs around, to impose new tariffs, to carousel through a rotating basket of tariffs. And that's something that the Speaker of the House has introduced in the last couple of weeks uh, to strip Russia and Belarus. Um, I've even heard that there are some in the Democratic caucus who would support stripping China as well of their permanent normalized trade relations status, which keeps them in the column one category of tariffs across all goods that are imported. So that's everything from alloys, to agriculture commodities, uh, imports of shoes or backpacks or whatever uh, particular product lines can come in. And the differential between column one and column two on the harmonized tariff schedule is robust. Two and a half percent is the import tariff on a number of goods coming in from Russia, if not zero, if you're in the PNTR status. If you move into column two, you can see that rise to 18 and a half percent, 45 percent, or even higher. And that discretion is something that they will leave with the administration to permanently be able to cycle through as they see fit and as the war escalates. Um, so the tariff move in particular is something to be watchful for, something we're advising clients to expect to come uh, once the Senate passes their version of the bill as early as this week. Henrietta, when it comes to real politic, though, do you think tariffs are going to be enough to dissuade Vladimir Putin? The, the administration is making it very clear that this is not going to become a hot war. Without that kind of commitment, do you really think that Russia is going to be deterred? Well, I don't know that deterrence is something you can get just from tariffs. That's why you're seeing the sanctions spread across individual oligarchs, across um, the capital market space, banking, kicking them off SWIFT, kicking them off the dollar clearing exchange. Yeah. This is um, something that also has a carrot component. And so you also want to watch that piece. Um, the long-term uh, viability of Russia is tethered to their energy sector. It's a near-term hit to the EU, um, to a much limited extent to the U.S. as well, um, from the energy, the LNG perspective, natural gas. But when you are evolving off of that reliance and the reliance on fossil fuels by, say, reducing or even increasing ethanol requirements to make more corn, more soy go into your blend. Those are moves that the administration can take that permanently harm Russia in the longer term, while not an immediate deterrent like, uh, say, you know, implementing a no-fly zone. That would obviously escalate and, and cause the United States and NATO allies to go to war with Russia directly, which is something everyone wants to avoid at this point. So it's a deterrence for the long run. Um, and the near-term deterrence, obviously, is focused on shifting personal opinion inside of Russia, um, hitting the oligarchs, trying to, trying to jam them up as much as possible. You're eliminating trillions of dollars in wealth in the blink of an eye uh, in, across the uh, top elite sectors of Russia. And so that's another piece of deterrent. But this is wholesale um, economic warfare. Henrietta, talk to us a little bit about the timeline here, because you do have messaging coming from Washington, the idea that cyber attacks might be coming, chemical weapons might be deployed, a lot of this idea that a lot of the infrastructure needs to be built, but that all takes time. What is the perspective in Washington when it comes to the timeline of how long this conflict will actually last? Are we talking about weeks, months, years? What's the take? The way that they're observing this war and this invasion is to throw everything at the wall, which suggests that they are anticipating that this will continue for a while. When we start talking about creating a situation with Spain where they buy our genetically modified corn for the first time in you know hundreds of years, that's a long haul commitment. Um, and this is, I think, going to be permanent uh, as far as Russia is concerned for the foreseeable future. And the question is more, do we incorporate China now? Or do we wait to see them institute some sort of an invasion of Taiwan or keep that distinct? As of this moment, what you're seeing from the Ambassador Tai, for instance, at the USTR, a new trade agreement reached with the UK to shift steel and aluminum tariffs off, take those 25% and 10% tariffs off after the Trump administration imposed them. Those are material sea changes building on her efforts with the EU and Japan. They are in this for, yeah. a, a, to put it from a timeline perspective, quite a while uh, at this point. And I would anticipate it is the most prominent factor of Biden's administration for the remainder of this term, which is obviously another two and a half years. Um, 
Biden's on his way across the Atlantic right now. He's going to land in Brussels a little bit later on. He's got uh, an EU summit to attend. He's got a NATO summit to attend. He's then going to be going to Poland. What is the objective of this visit right now? Is it to provide help and assistance to the EU on the energy front? Is it to coalesce the unity of the, uh, the group? I I'm just kind of wondering what, what is a win for Biden on this trip? It looks very much to me, based on the posturing I've seen from the administration, that we are expecting uh, to see some material sanctions uh, updates delivered from this next couple of days worth of travel to Brussels, to Poland. Um, that's going to include everything from giving an optic of the NATO allies all being together, something we have not gotten yet. So that, I think, will be very optically impactful, um, continuing to rally support amongst uh, embattled EU allies who are dealing with critical gas price hikes and shortages, and then also keeping uh, optimism and support alive here in the U.S., where support for these sanctions is very high, and it's going to need to be managed uh, for the future, um, particularly as we battle inflation here. But what I'm sensing um, from Jake Sullivan and from other leaders in the administration's office is that an announcement on energy policy is forthcoming. Um, I think there are a number of options here. You could see increased production in the United States announced. Um, we all know that Democrats have been talking about uh, maybe the Defense Production Act requiring more production, um, hearings to talk about what the uh, energy companies are doing in terms of pricing. We all know that that's something that's left to the gas companies individually, uh, localized around the nation. But I think it's going to be, most importantly for the investment community, some sort of an announcement on the energy front, uh, which is going to do yep. with increased supply um, and then also carrots, as we mentioned, whether that's from um, allowing the E15 standard or ethanol subsidization, uh, the blending requirements to shift, things along those lines is what I'm expecting.